I'm David Levi Strauss, the chair of the art writing program here, the MFA program in art writing at the School of Visual Arts. And this is the last of our spring series of Quixote Talks. And um, tonight we have Aaron Shore, and Aaron will read with Lisa Jarno on uh, this Saturday at 7 p.m. at Burl's Poetry, Brooklyn Poetry Shop, 126A Front Street in Dumbo. Um, when I told Annette that it was going to be difficult for me to introduce uh, Aaron tonight because we've known each other for so long, almost 40 years, uh, and there's so much to say about this, she characteristically said, well, then you should keep it short. <laughs> so, um, so I will do that. But I at least want to mention that Aaron and I were two of the very first students in the poetics program in San Francisco in the 1980s, led by the great poet Robert Duncan. And as all my students get tired of hearing, uh, the poetics program was a model for what I wanted to try to do with this program. Aaron went on to run his own poetics program the University of San Francisco and taught a whole generation of writers there. But we're here tonight to celebrate the publication of Aaron's new book, The Skin of Meaning, a perfect title that precisely invokes the embodied intelligence of Aaron's writing. Rereading these writings uh, collected here now, written over the last 30 years, what strikes me most is the personal and particular attention to prosody and poetics and the way that language lives in us and through us that makes Aaron a wonderful poet, a great teacher, and an exquisite essayist. He's the author of more than a dozen books, including Citizen from 2011, King of Shadows from 2008, and Involuntary Lyrics from 2005. Please welcome Aaron Shuren. Thank you, Levi. Um, didn't need to be any longer than that, that's for sure. That's the perfect size. And it is great to be here and be part of the Quixote Talks at the Art Writing MFA program here. Uh, let me unpack just a little bit. I'm going to be uh, reading from this new book and talking about it talking around it really, so I decided, what I, as I've been trying to think of what this event is, it's a talk around, that's what it is. And um, the book, as you've heard, is called The Skin of Meaning, Collected Literary Essays and Talks. In the Bay Area, in the 80s and 90s, we were always talking somehow, um, uh, back and forth and in conversation. The Bay Area is a special place where poetry uh, lives and breathes. And um, I wanted this talk around to have a title too. The book is called The Skin of Meaning. <clears throat> so I came up with, as I was working, I came up with a title for the talk around. First was Against Authority Per Se. That seemed reasonable enough, but I kept going. And then I came up with subjectivity and narration. So those are a couple of the things that I'm most interested in, in reference to critical writing, uh, particularly interest to the students at SVA here. Then I continue that and thought, well, how about on the wall in time and space? That was a little off the wall, I thought. <laughs> so then I found the angle of perception that was okay, and that led to the position of juxtaposition. <laughs> and then, as you could see, I could have kept going on and on and on and on. So I did, went back to the origin, decided, okay, the name of the talk around is the skin of meaning. But no, I had to stop there and say, really? The name of this event is the skin of me. So. And that makes a lot of sense because the subjective voice is one of the main things I'm interested in. As I've been shamelessly self-googling my book to see who or if anyone has noticed it, a few, 
I found a lot of near hits that have both skin and meaning in them. And almost all of them construct the phrase around the mereness of skin, peeling back the skin to go beneath the skin, as if it were something in the way, a barrier. But that is not the meaning of my skin. For me, skin is what's underneath. It's the body. It's what's there when you strip away the other layers of costume, language, figuration, and decoration. It's what you get down to. It's the reveal. And for sure, my skin is not mere. And in part because it's hard won, being a determined queer of a certain generation, I came out 50 years ago. <laughs> really? 50 years ago. Every bristling pore of my skin was fought for. The right to have a skin, to be in my own body as my own body felt itself to be, was a contested battle at least a decade, if not a lifetime long, for which I agitated, demonstrated, picketed, organized, wrote, and read. Once claimed, it would not be easily surrendered, my skin, my body. Both my literal body and my language body, the person, which is to say, the personal or subjective voice. Mine was never going to be a disembodied poetics. I'm a skin dude. <laughs> to speak from the skin, the way we sometimes say someone speaks from the heart. But what does that mean really? It means to speak from or as a person, not a voice or a sentence. Gravitas accrues to the person of the skin. It's skin, but it's also my, the first person possessive. Can I say I speak to possess my own skin? If you in any way have been a second class citizen, you will understand that to get to be the first person is an essential act of command, of pride, and of will. It's my skin, and I claim the position from which to speak, to speak from the meaning of my skin. So from the very beginning, I decided it would be essential for my critical and theoretical writing to inhabit the first person. That my critical voice would, pros pro would progress via that often forbidden I. Simply, the subjective voice issues from a body, a person. Its domain, after all, is person, not text. We say the first person, not the first text. And I've had very little interest in delivering my precious subjectivity to some neutral, pseudo-objective faint like one could say or such. Yes, these are all language strategies, but I have been less interested in the idea of some objective, non-person voice than I have been in the idea of a critical voice arising from a specific human in a given situation with particular thoughts. Is it messy that way? Oh yes, alarmingly, fabulously messy. That I stand inside of my views, that I have views, is one part of the subjective voice. The other part is that you do too. Mine are mine and yours are yours, my is a version. The first person is a linguistic shifter that belongs to the speaker. You say it and it's yours. The first person claims power, but not authority. The art, its article is a, not the. So paradoxically, the first person suggests a plurality of views. Let everyone seize the I and speak. 
the initial proposed title was Against Authority Per Se. <clears throat> My first serious piece of critical writing, my thesis in poetics from the days that Levi spoke of, this was um, at New College of California, written in 1982. This was my critical thesis on Whitman. It begins, my memory, my memory of the event is partial, like a dream from which only the central nugget-like image remains. I walked up the aisle of the classroom to the blackboard, bounding in my enthusiasm to share the discovery I'd made. I wrote in chalk these words from Whitman's Song of Myself. Dazzling and tremendous, how quick the sunrise would kill me if I could not now and always send sunrise out of me. And some hundred pages later, the last chapter of my thesis says, begins, I stand in the decrepitude and failed agonies of Whitman's poetic democracy, of Darwin's evolved species and Hegel's progressive dialectic. Today, December 22nd, 1981, the 206th year of the states as Whitman would have it, a rehearsal of the mere geographical names of the nation Nations calls up misery and civil strife. Really, you can't position yourself more specifically than that. So that was the very beginning of my critical writing. And I thought to start uh, the reading part, I would read from the first piece in this book, The Skin of Meaning, a very short piece um, called Like a Book. <clears throat> Having recently understood I was moving toward narrative in my writing, that moving being narrativity that interested me, to bring forward what I first called the outside world, then social relations, and finally evil, I'd felt compelled a film documentary about the Loz ghetto in Poland helped break me down to it. An inhabitant had written in a secret journal, if anyone got out of here alive and had the chance to blow up the whole world, he would do it, and he would be right. The moral assurance of that statement seemed to me as far upside down as one could go. Horror, ruined, forsaken, living in total pain. Hell's literalness, the blackest thing I think I ever heard said. So I had felt compelled to read Holocaust writing and found myself on summer vacation picking up a copy of Primo Levi's Survival in Auschwitz. I saw my timing and thought to open the book when I returned thereby not sabotaging my release time on Cape Cod. But one is commanded by books as much as the other way around. And so in bright June, open early summer in Provincetown, I found myself entering Auschwitz trying to survive. The tides that rise and run from the small bay leave slick and shiny mud flats in the late afternoon. The dusty light brings things to serene paleness, washed away, withdrawn, hushed, isolated pilings, and form the sweetest of moments in P-Town whose picket-fenced sweetness is sometimes too neat, cloying. The long sand cliff Truro beaches of Longnook and Ballston are the archetype of heat-blasted summer delirium and luscious nothingness. Survival in Auschwitz, there. And survival in Auschwitz on the white chenille bedspread by lamplight and in the peony garden on white wrought iron. The book read like a book. I read it like a book. Turned pages toward their narrative projections relished perversity and antagonism as well as heroics, survival, that's narrative tension, and shuddered at my inability to find a deeper, 
more problematized way in? Is it not writing but reading that's in trouble post-Holocaust? What model of reading would properly hold for such an encounter? Would I have to stand thigh deep in ice water, read by penlight in an airless closet? Or would the writing itself need to change reading? Would it need to discomfort, to use dreams technique of fracture and surprise, paranoia's looming enlargements, hunger's hallucinations, pain's throbbing rhythms, identity's multiple dislocations, politics' layered lies, all of which are possible functions of referentiality and narrativity suitably fucked up, to break the habits of reading formed by studious information gathering and pleasure, to make these uneasy arrivals alluring enough to encounter the way Dante makes you willing to go through hell is a compelling challenge I'm being given dangerously. That's dated 1990. So, and I wanted to say just for the record, going to the skin of meaning at large, in following through this idea of the first person writing, of the first nine pieces in the skin of meaning, eight of them begin first personally. There's the one I just read like a book. Narrativity starts, I'm interested in the utilization of both poetic and narrative tensions. A thing unto myself starts, I am in a pronominal funk. The complexities of measure begins who I want to be or think I am in fancy, how the world should make justice shine, the revelatory power of what I think you ought to know. Oh, I'm a stupid fuck, why trust me? The eruptive text waits till the beginning of the second paragraph to say, Safe within the luxury and quirk of my reading habits, I meet, etc. Involuntary lyrics, a footnote goes, after 15 years of prose poems, I was wandering away back to verse. Not wandering, that the, the uh, proofreader kept saying, do you mean wandering? No, I was wandering away back to verse. Prosody now begins with the first person plural before it goes to, in that verbal and shimmer and glow, I've flung myself across the carpeted floor, etc. And the note to the student, these are the, of the first nine pieces, from time to time I like to pull back and take a macrocosmic view. So, uh, really I'm not at all a theory head, I'm an experience head. The opening of narrativity says, I'm interested in the etc. And that's really one of my favorite beginnings because it favors human behavior over blind declaration. I'm interested in stakes no claim to authority, but opens every window to critical insight against authority per se. And really, I'm interested in what ways and how you're interested. Once you lose the idea of authority, you become vulnerable, which is to say open to and so subject to the art or event. So that's the other face of subjectivity. You are the person to whom art or experience happens. To be the subject means you subject yourself to experience. Lose the cape, put on your sweats, drop your shoulders, and let it come to you. You may find it interesting or not, and if not, that's interesting too. So that's my first formal interest, a critical response in a subjective frame. The second issue pointed to by my speculative titles is narration, by which your interests are made dramatic by being placed in space and time instead of exhumed from your brain and entombed for safekeeping in that inert form called the objective. Where were you when you got interested? What space did you occupy? How did your responses, your thinking, change and develop 
What was the arc of your interaction? Perhaps, back to the titles again, Against Authority argues not for your conclusion, but for your process of engagement that becomes the conclusion. I'm interested in thought as action, in portraying critical thinking as movement, as interactive, as involving risk, the risk of the adventure of perception. If a critical engagement resembles a dialectic with its action, art, for example, reaction, the viewer, for example, and synthesis, the critical response, it also resembles the classic dramatic arc of a story with its protagonist, resistance, and resolution. The tensions and resolutions at play are already dramatic via the push and pull of inquiry. So to bring forward the narrative underpinnings of any critical engagement, the process or procession of thought is really just to lay bare, well, its skin of meaning, the heave and swell in the body of thought. Essentially, I think this is really just a matter of what the Greeks called pathos. The reader is brought forward into the experience by an emotional stirring awakened by the recognition of the unfolding tension of human experience. It's human to human identification. It's analysis and intellection as experience, an active, not a passive process. When we say the reader is moved, that's action. She's moved from one place to another. No playgoer sitting on the hard stone benches at the great amphitheater at Epidaurus wants to watch a production of Medea and think, very interesting point, that infanticide. <laughs> no, you should be shrieking and tearing your hair out. So to be positioned in time and space creates a drama of perception, and the drama stirs an emotional response from the reader to go along with her intellectual response, and it seems to me this is a holistic encounter. The speculative titles were Subjectivity and Narration and On the Wall in Time and Space. So I'm going to read something. Actually, I'm going to read the next two pieces that I will read are from the central section of of the Skin of Meaning, which reproduces a book called Unbound, subtitled The Book of AIDS, which was a book of writing about AIDS that was published in 1997, uh, and really was the ground where I began to um, discover uh, a, an essayistic writing that was going to be um, appropriate to my own interests and engagements. So the first piece I'm going to read is a meditation on a photograph a short piece called Shifting Paradise, and it's from 1995. It's got a little epigraph from Chaucer in Middle English, which I will massacre thusly. Oh, I won't massacre it, I'm just going to tell you. To show you the way in this viage of Vilka Parfit glorious pilgrimage that heaked Jerusalem celestial. To show you the way in this voyage of that perfect glorious pilgrimage that's, ca to the, that's called celestial Jerusalem. I finally framed the painting by Tasha Robbins. An abstracted cross swirl of tree stumps, raising among its energy loops a curious reminiscence of human figuration. And the portraits and posters on my old familiar walls, having duly shifted places to accommodate this newcomer, are calling to each other, to me, with a re reawakened vigor, as if by being moved they've fallen under new spotlights, bearing their active souls again for my renewable eyes. Chairs and tables, moody lamps, 
regularly do this dance in my house, and over again what seemed fixed loosens, reshapes interior meaning as complementary presence, pluralized out from each object or piece of art to bear relation in the cosmology of household deities. Here on the cheap light weight fold-out bookcase, it pretends to Japanese. Under the orange volcanic vase, spewing trails of eucalyptus nuts and corkscrew willows, is the one personal photo that owns a public space in my art stuff department. Five young men caught mid-gamble in a park. A little chorus line of kicks, gropes, arm over shoulder wraps, and wide, too wide smiles. Yes, that's me. If you don't ask, I'll point it out. In the wild prophet hair and beard, a tangle of exuberant energy far the other side of saturation. My tucked in kimonos bared to the waist, Where you can spot, look closely, I don't think you can look that closely, the much admired hand beaded belt, <laughs> snake skin waffled in maroon, mauve, and chalky blue, with its moon slice mother of pearl buckle. The ferocity of hair and pure glaze of sunlight reek of period. The year is 1975. It's forever 1975. The men are queer. Well, one is honorary. And Golden Gate Park has offered its swooping cypresses and Monterey pines to border the rolling fields of that summer's Gay Freedom Day celebration. There is no other picture in my house of paradise, though there is a veil of soul making Whatever reconstellating takes place, its rarefied image stays true. The spontaneous fraternal beatitude, renegade eros, and radical hilarity of that San Francisco hover like elements of celestial Jerusalem at the apex of memory. No maturity, no fine mellowness, no deepened work dissolves them. Through the clear painterly air, as if all of San Francisco had northern light, epical details sharpen. There, the city's edge of the world history joins its urgent Pacific geography to clasp my hand in a lover's vow. I married San Francisco on a brisk, craggy hilltop in 1978 in lieu of a boyfriend. <laughs> this other Eden, demi-paradise, rhapsodizes John of Gaunt, Shakespeare's John of Gaunt, similarly England besotted. This happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea. Extravagant phrases of praises gild memory. One no longer knows the actual from the iconic. The icon becomes the actual. Where physical distance blurs, temporal distance refines. This much has not shifted. On a shelf, in a, a lucite frame, encodes the past in a photo, unregenerate as a paradise of pure loss. But something has shifted. The resonant image, gingerly holding its chemical colors against the fading powers of sunlight, remains the same. But the very nature of paradise has changed. Even while eyes dewy, focused back on primal beauty, the unforeseen, HIV, transfigures sight, beholder, and beheld. This sceptered isle, Shakespeare's Gaunt has said, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection, 
the magic island is flooded in a breakaway recursive tide. What did not hold, infected, returns to alter the image of origin. Stein, let me recite what history teaches. History teaches. We stage the past in jewel terms to fix its daunting fluidity and give name to our nostalgia. But HIV has modified this delicate taxonomy. The paradigm shifts. A newly burnished glaze shines. A viral invasion has reconfigured the utopian body so that what once was seen tenderly as youth is now revisited as the unacknowledged genius of health. The circling age rings and Tasha's painted tree trunks I see today are like the ovoid loops we practice to draw the human face. Her small oil of a foot among clouds rises on my bedroom wall above Nikki's green collage with its palm forward open hand. Familiar domestic talismans, these, one sleeping, the other awake, that make of any wall a window through which I view some measure of self. Catching the last flare of sunset, they signal it across the room to a poster in French for Fellini's Les Nuits de Cabiria, where Julietta Messina in a chicken feather coat flutters her fingers gamely at other seekers winging the night. In this crosswind of salutations, the photo from 1975 has moved to my work table. Under gooseneck light, I study its captive luminosity, its fable of youth, to be sure, and florid, sunny conviviality, but more now, shifted paradise, its depiction, its retention, of life before AIDS. That's from 1995. So the third challenge that has been interesting to me is how to get in. And that's the title called The Position of Juxtaposition or The Angle of Perception. You can start at the beginning, which is really once upon a time, but that's sort of been done, hasn't it? Or you can arrive in the middle or slice in on an angle and take your material by surprise, or should I say, be taken by surprise. The adventure of response may be exactly not knowing where to begin. It's about finding, not knowing. Don't be a smarty pants. Take off your smarty pants. If you slip in by the side door, you may find what the art is trying to hide, or perhaps more interestingly, what you are trying to hide. If you begin in the middle, you may discover that there are actually multiple possible openings or many endings or perhaps no endings. What if there is just middle, just experiences that splay laterally or circularly but do not perform the simple trajectory of topic sentence pushing towards its little climax? Maybe we could call such writing from the middle polymorphous perverse, which is to say the skin touched everywhere, releases meaning. So um, instead of reading from the book, because I do want to read this one other piece, um, there was something that, I, that really stayed in my mind and given my, the previous piece about survival in Auschwitz, which was the, a section of the film Shoah, the incredible documentary about the Holocaust by Claude Lanzmann. And there's an amazing scene in it that takes place in a village in Poland, um, uh, one of the famous villages where the extermination process was extraordinarily refined. 
And what they did in this town was they herded the Jews into a church. Then they had built a little platform that just met exactly the back of the church and also met exactly the back of the truck that pulled up to the back of the church so that when the Jews were herded out the back of the church across the platform into the truck and then uh, the hose was attached from the exhaust into the truck, the truck went off to the pit that was dug and by the time it reached there, the Jews had been exterminated. Neat, clean, perfectly done. Nobody accepted culpability for it ever, of course, because the moral question is too vast for people to consider or to, um, to accept guilt over. But what Claude Lanzmann does in this extraordinarily large picture, talks to somebody who, I, maybe he was a carpenter, but he certainly had something to do with building the platform. And of all the giant questions one could ask, ask he asks this man, how high would you say that platform was? And he answers, and it's the first time, because instead of asking him all those other questions, he goes in in this tiny little detail, and then the guy answers that, and so the whole question of culpability is then released because Lanzmann went in at this particular little angle and found the way um, to have the man uh, open the whole situation of, of guilt. So uh, that's one of the guide points for my angle in. And I wanted to read one other uh, piece for you, uh, maybe that comes in in this kind of circular way, actually. And it's, um, it's in response to the great Jean Cocteau film called Orphe or Orpheus. So I need to give you a little bit of background for this scene, and I'm going to show you a little five-minute clip from the movie and then read the piece that responds to that. Um, the, the film is about Orpheus, the great poet. Uh, let's see, I wrote it down so that I could remember everything I wanted to say. So here's what I wrote to myself. Uh, Orpheus is the great acclaimed poet, but in fact, he is too acclaimed, and his verses have gone flat. He's become too popular, and he's just written to the popular level. So enter death, or in French, l'amour, which rhymes with l'amour, love and death. So enter death, his death, in the form of a glamorous woman. And death loves a poet because, well, that's how a poet becomes immortal, through dying. Certainly not through the fame that comes in your lifetime. Um, and uh, her underlings, death's underlings, begin to supply Orpheus with strange phrases that excite him and that awaken his poetry, and this comes via the radio. It's very complicated, but all of these will be hit in the piece. Um, and that, that place where they're playing the radio and transmitting the phrases to Orpheus, Cocteau calls the zone, and you get into that zone by traveling through the mirror. So uh, these are the figures that are very Cocteau-saturated and that appear in the piece, and you'll see mostly in the movie, of death and the zone and the phrases from the radio and the mirror. And uh, death has exceeded her authority by really falling in love with Orpheus and by giving him these phrases. So she is brought before a tribunal of judges for, um, for exceeding her uh, the bounds of what she's allowed to do. So this is where the movie picks up. Ils arrivent. Allez. Salut. Nous sommes faits comme des rares. Ne vous y trompez pas, monsieur, vous êtes devant mes juges. Restez calme. Approchez. Eh bien, Hurtbiz, voilà le moment de dire ce que vous avez à dire. Mais je n'ai rien à dire. Vous êtes accusé d'avoir pris part à une intrigue où la mort s'est introduite sans aucun ordre supérieur. 
Avez-vous une excuse valable C'était son aide. Je l'ai suivi. Vous vous êtes cependant attardé dans l'autre monde pour des affaires humaines auxquelles vous n'avez aucun droit. Peut-être. Il n'y a pas de peut-être ici. Répondez. Ce n'est pas cru désobéir. Approchez. Vous. Vous. Moi Oui, vous. Votre nom. Orphée. Votre profession Poète. La fiche porte écrivain. C'est presque la même chose. Il n'y a pas de presque ici. Qu'appelez-vous poète Écrire sans être écrivain. Vous reconnaissez cet homme Oui. Vous reconnaissez avoir emmené sa femme Oui. Pour vous débarrasser d'elle et tenter de n'avoir cet homme qu'à vous. Monsieur Il a un. Du calme, monsieur, du calme. Gardez votre calme. Aimez-vous cet homme Aimez-vous cet homme Oui. Est-il exact que vous alliez le regarder dormir dans sa chambre Oui. Signez cette feuille. Avez-vous un stylographe <rire> J'oubliais que vous n'êtes pas écrivain. Conduisez ces deux personnes dans la chambre. Pas vous. Restez. Reconnaissez-vous cet homme Mais oui, c'est Ortebise. A-t-il essayé de vous parler en l'absence de votre mari En va-t-il prononcer des paroles coupables Coupables Mais non, c'est Ortebise. Ortebise, aimez-vous cette femme Heurtebise, aimez-vous cette femme Oui. C'est tout ce que nous voulions savoir. Signé. Et tu leur as répondu oui. On ne peut pas mentir chez nous. Je t'aimais bien avant notre première rencontre. J'ai dû te paraître si stupide. Qu'est-ce que nous pouvons nous dire Je n'ai le droit d'aimer personne. Et j'aime. Tu es toute puissante. À vos yeux. Chez nous, il y a des figures innombrables de la mort. Des jeunes, des vieilles qui reçoivent des ordres. Et si tu désobéissais à ces ordres, ils ne peuvent pas te tuer, c'est toi qui tues. Ce qu'ils peuvent est pire. D'où viennent ces ordres Tant de sentinelles se les transmettent que c'est le tam-tam de vos tribus d'Afrique. L'écho de vos montagnes le vent des feuilles de forêt. J'irai jusqu'à celui qui donne ses ordres. Mon pauvre amour, il n'habite nulle part. Les uns croient qu'ils pensent à nous, d'autres qu'ils nous pensent, d'autres qu'ils ordrent que nous sommes son rêve, son mauvais rêve. Je t'arracherai d'ici, puisqu'on nous laisse libre. Libre 
je ne veux plus te quitter. Je vais te quitter. Mais je te jure que je trouverai le moyen de nous réunir. Dis pour toujours. Pour toujours. Je l'ai. Je le jure. Mais maintenant... Maintenant. Maintenant, il y a leur police. Il arrivera un miracle. Les miracles ne se produisent que chez vous. Tous les mondes sont émus par l'amour. Dans notre monde, on est neuf personnes. Cocteau will not be silent. <laughs> This is called Orphe, the kiss of death. The poet falls in love with the world and constantly dies for it. Circle of frenzy and release, Orphe. Or the poet expires so that his, her, words may live. Is that the same as not having a social life? He falls literally into the hands of l'amour, la mort. Orphée, Jean Marais, and his death, Maria Cazares, stalk each other. Their primal attraction is poetic divination and fate, seen in love's mirror as mutual fire in the eyes. It's not about understanding, it's about belief. Expectant Vain, exalted, Orpheus takes his lover's vow, poet's creed, toujours, je jure, the rhyme of always and I swear, oath of eternal enactment, is the same for artist and lover, to go all the way through the mirror's veil, say forever. For Cocteau, The dramas, a Parisian romance, played out between pompadour and high heels. The scene borrows glamour from Hollywood to push the metaphor and make it itch. The eternal oath is sealed with a hot kiss. She's in two-piece wasp waist escoffier, and he's all jawline and raked blonde hair. Where earlier the radio of inspiration might have been the muse's wellspring, now it's background music to an embrace. Cazares lights a cigarette. Do you love this man? Demands the judge. Cazares exhales, says nothing. Insistent, do you love this man? Oui. Orphe swells and gasps. Death's black gloves and pearls. Alone in the adjacent room, mon amour, they touch, they kiss, they fall to the bed. Cazares' teardrop face, pointed chin and radically upswept eyes, like Satan herself, is bathed in light. They lie down forever and swear. After 15 years and perhaps a dozen viewings, I'm watching the movie again with my students, having offered to initiate them into Cocteau's mystery, the resonant unfolding charm of perfect metaphor, each side ceaselessly amplifying the other. This is the heart of the movie, the scene that's always held me in thrall, death explaining the universal chain of command that I've read as creative order, the order of form, calling the poet to work, transmitted by so many messengers that it's like the tom-toms of your African tribes, the echoes of your mountains, the wind in the leaves of your forests. But this time I'm feeling weak at the knees. Something new in the scene disturbs me. I feel oddly embarrassed, shocked. I'm pulled out of the poetics and land in the purely transgressive nature of the kiss unsettling, scandalous, he's kissing death. It may seem moody and romantic, but he's making love to death. Why am I so unbalanced now by this familiar scene? D.H. Lawrence, why does the thin gray strand floating up from the forgotten cigarette between my fingers, why does it trouble me? Ah, you will understand. <clears throat> 
These well-worn words have redefined themselves. Kiss of death. The kiss of death. How altered my sense of this stock phrase. <clears throat> How literal its reinvention. How fearfully now behind each stolen kiss. How courageously behind each true one. How familiar death has become in my casual life. How complexly my friends have embraced it. Ah, you will understand. AIDS. AIDS. For now, overlaid upon Cocteau's poetic myth is a real kiss, newly fabled. My old friend Marshall is nursing his dying lover, Ken. The frame cannot be bleached of Ken's willful blue sores, skeleton haunted body, feverish lips. Hollywood lighting will not erase the shadow in his cheeks, ashen tinge of skin. In a pale room on a San Francisco hill, the morning before Ken dies, his lover's oath continues, I love you, baby. To his mother, this is my farewell kiss to you. To Marshall eagerly, kiss me, baby. Ken doesn't have the advantage of a cinched black dress and pearls. He's wearing padded hospital diapers, pulling them down because he feels they're not sexy. He says to Marshall, suck my lizard tongue. Marshall does. I'm shaking in the juncture of Cocteau's spirit zone and my friend's house. Do actual death and disease derange the vital, the vital romance of this lived scene? Do they disgust and terrorize, black out the spotlight, stop the radio? I've seen in the announcement of this true kiss a hail of blisters, spiral rashes, white spots on the tongue, thin lusterless hair, sunken cough-tracked chests, purple swollen noses, fading eyes, parched throats. In my work, at my desk, on the tip of my pen, on your lips, on your tongue, I see Jackson's distended lymphatic neck, Eric's giant eyes, Yolo's broken walk, Chuck's pushing skull, Leland's loose pulling skin. These are the images that would stop the kisses, silence the poem. They don't stop Marshall, who's met his fate in Ken's love, not in his death, whose oath takes him within the failing heart of his beloved and beats there. Marshall, who delivers a fearless kiss in the transfixed zone where death's permanence lets love keep living. Before encountering his death, Orpheus is dead tired. His form has gone flat. Celebrity has leached from his work the edge of daring. He pleases. Orpheus, your most serious defect is knowing just how far one can go, but no farther. In the words transmitted from the zone by Dead Say Jest and the Princess, discreet surreal phrases and the formal purity of numbers, Orpheus rediscovers his passionate disequilibrium. He pushes through to a place he doesn't understand, but believes in, down through the layers and accretions of mud, language, faces in the mirror, beloved's glances, worn rhythms to an intuited measure found in a black and pure embrace. The poet meeting his fate in poetry, the lover in lover, in loving, propriety serves neither, both must go too far. In that rapturous clasp of Orphe and his death, I recognize the grip of devotion the intent out of bounds, the pure work. Robert Duncan, our uses are our illuminations. Throughout the zone, 
memories of men in the ruins of their habits and haunting the house. Mere information restrains hand and heart, the giving and the art. Many are abandoned by those unwilling to go far enough. Will it be easier if I say goodbye, asks Marshall, standing there. Yes, answers Ken, say goodbye. And here the kiss of death is love's wound healed by love's avowal. Princess, I must leave you, but I swear I'll find a way for us to be united. Orpheus, say forever, princess, forever. Orpheus, swear to it, princess, I swear. Thank you. Um, I didn't really see how to make an ending after that. So I will let that be the ending of that part. And I know I've gone on through time. Um, I'll be happy to ans ask, answer any questions or ask any questions if you have any or hear any comments you would like to offer. I told myself a tale that I didn't exactly know I was telling in that construction. But it is true that the heart of this book is the book about AIDS, and it occupied a large period of time in the, in the 30 years that this book covers. Um, and it also was the place in which I had to create a new kind of writing for myself. So um, I think it's there for more than just the subject reasons. It's there also because it, it activated the writing in a particular way. Through the experience of AIDS that, that, that um, demanded that I write about it, um, it, I think it grew from, from my writing about me to writing about others. And I had to, and once I was writing about others, narrative was reinforced. Um, it's, it's, you can make narrative with your own self, like that shifting paradise piece, really. I construct a narrative about looking at that photograph. But during the AIDS epidemic, when I was largely a witness to other people's experience, um, the, the narrative of events was more narrative, and demanded a different kind of narrative, and demanded a different kind of attention, and demanded um, sometimes um, story arcs, and um, dialogue, people, what people had said. So that was very different. And in fact, there's another book of prose that's not in this. I wish I could have conflated the two of them together, which really came after the book about AIDS, which really was circumstantial narrative, which really were the essays that were, um, that in which narrative took hold and developed. And this is a kind of a sampling of a whole range of them. But I think the AIDS crisis uh, made me look and listen outwards in a new way. Well, I, I mean, again, I think, I think what joins them in this book is the act of writing, not the subject. It was how the writing, how the, what kind of writing was demanded of me as I began, I do say, let's see, I think that's 1990, that piece. So that is in the early years, the middle of AIDS. Um, like the book is 1990. So it is written completely in the middle of the AIDS epidemic. But it's um, the, the issue was how to write. And sure, I think, I think what this talk has laid bare, which I didn't realize, was that um, I, I, that the Auschwitz was standing for the metaphor? I do say the outside world, social relations, and finally evil. And so I think the weight of the years of the ep gravity of the epidemic of AIDS um, was there as I was mapping out a kind of writing that the that reading the survival Auschwitz was calling forth for me. 
It's interesting because um, I knew that I knew that the, the work which is called Unbound was central to this book. It's the middle section of the book, um, and at one point the editors kind of suggested that maybe I not include that because it's literary essays and talks, and it's not exactly literary. And I wrote them a very careful and uh, specific letter explaining why it needed to be there, why it was always conceived of as a poetics, always. It was how to make a sense as in poetics of this extraordinary material. And also, it was my work of those years. There wasn't another kind of work that was permitted me. I, that was the work I had to do. And they um, very intelligently accepted every point I made. And, and so I got to include that. But what I did do is write a new piece for this book called Binding Unbound, in which I talk about the reasons why that work needed to be in this collection and w how I was called to write about AIDS. And where it was published, it was all published in the magazines that were published in my poetry. It wasn't published in gay magazines or social scientist magazines. It was all published in the same literary publications and poetry journals that were publishing um, my poetry. So it, that, it certainly had its place there. It was, um, it was an incredible responsibility. But it was also, I had been gifted because what I saw, as you can see from Marshall, was extraordinary acts of illumination and generosity and transcendence way beyond the, um, the daily. And so uh, it was really, th the, ultimately, the responsibility I had was to deliver the gift that I had been given <coughs> carefully. And that was a challenge. And it took me a really long time. A really long time. In fact, um, the way I end, let me just find that one little passage for you. Um, there's a, both a, the book has a lot of prefaces and a lot of afterwords. I think it's a form I favor. Um, This is the original preface to Unbound, the end of it, and it says, um, my own ever baby face receded as I stood in the shadows and watched the light flame others. The writing progressed as narration. Authority, not mine, but an urge toward the integration of fear and, immuta and immutable fact, and a heart for consequence. Who could have moved me to this end but the men whose names are mentioned here, who were my informants and guides, and whose natural affectional alliances made an epidemic based on love and desire possible. It soon became clear that for me, writing about AIDS was weighted towards witness. Such participations, cursed, rare privileges offered to you. And then the end of the new piece that I wrote introducing it um, says, Unbound, it, um, I say that I, I thought I was, uh, that I blew down a lot of barriers of my own in writing it. Unbound formed in the clearing as a series of inquiries and interjections. A rising arc inside a descending spiral, a way out that was a way in. And if I have given the impression that my endeavors were somehow heroic, it is a fiction of the shorthand of my telling. I agonized over how to write. I was late to the task. I trembled nervously over the transcendental gifts my friends had given me. But I was surrounded by what I might, might properly call a sense of duty, even if at some times it felt like nowhere to run. AIDS chased me down, cornered me, and stuck a pen in my hand. Thank you very much for listening. It was a pleasure to be here.